uh, webinar, which is uh, titled Huntington's Disease, the Present and Future of Imaging Biomarkers. So um, today we're going to explore the following topics. So we're going to look at the current clinical trial landscape for Huntington's disease, the challenges and opportunities, the role of imaging uh, and natural history uh, data in HD tri clinical trials, and of course, as always, like your opportunity to uh, have your questions answered by our panel during the webinar. So I have the distinct pleasure of, uh, actually I've got the to show the agenda, but uh, let's uh, start off with the presenter, uh, presenter introductions. Then we're going to go through uh, Christina's uh, presentation, followed by Marina, and then uh, the Q&A section, which will be moderated by Chief Scientific Officer Robin Walls. So today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our presenters. Um, so I'll just start off with um, uh, Christina Sampaio, Chief, Chief Medical Officer at CHDI, who currently holds that position. Uh, and is also serving as a professor of clinical pharmacology at Lisbon Medical School at the University of Lisbon. Uh, throughout her career, she's been a member of both the Committee of Proprietary Medicine, Medicinal Products and Scientific Advice Board Party of the European Medicines Agency. So her contributions have been uh, provided guidance to new medicinal products and especially for those in orphan diseases like Huntington's disease and other neurode neurodegenerative diseases that were highly valued. Um, her research interests are centered around designing and implementing clinical studies in neurodegenerative disorders, pharmacoepidemiology, and evidence-based medicine. And in her current role, she has notably advanced the field of Huntington's disease therapeutics by developing biomarkers, assessment tools, and enhancing clinical trial infrastructure. So welcome aboard, Christina. And uh, Marina Papuzzi, uh, Senior Biomarker Scientist at Ixico, um, she has more than 15 years of experience in neuroimaging for CNS in both academia and industry. Uh, she currently supports Ixico's clients and studies uh, with the use of med uh, medical imaging in movement disorders such as hunting disease, ataxias, and Parkinsonian syndromes. Prior to joining Ixico, uh, Marina was a senior research fellow at the U at UCL HD Center for nine years and worked on projects such as Tricon HD. Uh, she maintains an affiliation and close collaboration with the UCL HD Center to date and is also a member of the HDY uh, Youth Organization, so HDYO Research Committee. Um, hello to you, Marina. Um, and of course, uh, the moderator for today, our Chief Scientific Officer Robin Waltz, uh, who has been uh, at Ixco for over 10 years in product, uh, and has over 10 years of uh, product development and innovative analytic solutions in healthcare with a focus in imaging technology. And prior to Ixico, Robin held uh, different roles at Phillips, uh, Phillips in Research and Diagnostics X-ray Division, um, and he holds a PhD in Medical Imaging and Computer Science from Imperial College London, focused on early detection of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, he's a co-author of more than 100 publications and holds multiple patents in the field of medical imaging and AI data analytics. So, welcome aboard, Robin. So, without before we start into Christine's presentation, I want to start off with the poll. So. Um, this is going to take over the screen, so don't be shocked. Uh, we're just going to launch that now. Um, the question is going to be this. So if you can see this on your screen, um, we'd like to know what would be the main reason for using imaging in your trial? So it's a multiple choice, multiple answer question here. We're looking at safety, efficacy, and eligibility. So um, this poll's going to run for the next 30 seconds. So uh, currently at the moment, I'm looking at the live responses here and everybody's looking at efficacy. It's overwhelming at 85%. Uh, but of course, like, you know, we're always looking at the fine line between safety and eligibility as well, um, which makes sense, of course. And I think down the line, there's always that, uh, the, the, the sort of um, the gray line that we all have to tread between how do we get the effectiveness of the drug versus uh, keep making sure that we're keeping the patient safe. I'm going to close the poll off now and I'm going to share the results with you. So we kind of stopped the we stopped the poll at 79% um, for efficacy, then 56% uh, for safety, and then 44% for eligibility. So I guess this is going to help frame uh, Christina and Marina's conversations when they're doing their presentations, as well as part of uh, the Q&A. And so this is where I get to hand over to Christina, um, where she will present uh, on topic today. So just bear with me a second whilst I get, make her the presenter. And I pass it over to you, Christina. Okay, thank you. Um, hope 
my my screen you can see the screen one second that's right uh, i think so yeah you are the presenter but i can't see your screen <laughs> okay my try again i'm going to try that one more time thanks folks for bearing with us <laughs> make myself a presenter show my screen and then i'm going to make you the presenter again one more time apologies for this there we go yes should get the prompt now christina let me know if that works yeah. for you yes now it's working perfect there you go leave me to it take it away okay so just so good afternoon everyone and uh, um it's indeed uh, thank you for the introduction jay and uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here and the, I must say that um, the answers to the poll does not surprise me, but I, I hope you will not be very disappointed if I say that uh, the efficacy desire is the most difficult one to achieve. In any case, we will we'll go speaking about this during the presentation. Just a disclaimer, I get this, a salary from a, a company called CHDI, CHDI Management which is a company that advises the CHDI Foundation. And this is the only disclaimer that is relevant for this presentation. I'm also consulting privately outside the field of Huntington's, mostly in other neurodegenerative diseases. And that's what it is in this slide. Uh, uh, I was asked to explain what CHDI is and uh, how CHDI works. I would recommend all of you to go to the CHDI website, particularly to this link. There is a very nice uh, video that, that explains CHDI in two minutes, kind of an animation video. It's quite nice to see. But uh, uh, if you don't want to spend that time going to the website, very quickly, I, I must say that CHDI exists for 20 years now. And from the beginning, the idea of CHDI, the, the way of work has been to facilitate the development of uh, drugs for HD, interventions for HD, but not exactly uh, conducting drug development itself. So the concept of CHDI was to, in the very beginning, let's say in the first 10 years, it was mostly in the preclinical space, working on the let's say, creating the tools and the mechanisms to facilitate the, the crossing of the death valley. So to facilitate translation from the preclinical to clinical developments and hope that companies would take over and would do their clinical developments after this push from CHDI. So in these first 10 years, there was almost no clinical activity in, the, in CHDI. And then, in the last 10 years, uh, there was the realization that there was need as well to keep developing infrastructure and tools to help companies develop their clinical programs. And that's what we have been doing. So CHDI is, uh, we don't have competitors. We are a collaborator, an enabler to all companies trying, trying to bridge across the different gaps that exist for clinical developments. Uh, in the clinical space, in the clinic, the clinical organization of CHDI that I that I uh, supervise, uh, I have several units working in different programs: uh, wet biomarkers, neuroimaging, uh, clinical outcomes, regulatory science, uh, statistics and modeling, etc. Uh, I, I I decided to show you my clinical neuroimaging unit and the people that that are part of it, uh, to whom I, I want to acknowledge and thank because uh, today's discussion is mostly about neuroimaging and that's their expertise, not mine. Uh, so here, here are they. And uh, of course, if any of you in the audience will need some help from CHDI, um, uh, Andrew Wood is the lead of the unit you are free to reach out and uh, we'll try to, to sort out the, whatever problem you have. 
we have been very active in this field. And as I said, our way of work is to collaborate. And so these are some of our latest uh, publications in the neuroimaging area. Some of them were done with, in collaboration with IBM. Others were done in collaboration with CPAS, like the integrated, integrated staging system. And uh, some, the last one, has been done in collaboration with UCL. So this very quickly, I thought it was good to uh, uh, revisit some advances in the HD pathogenesis because this has a direct impact on the therapeutic landscape. Then, uh, of course, I intend to review the therapeutic landscape and speak about how imaging biomarkers relate with the clinical development. So, of course, all of you are aware that Huntington's disease is autosomal dominant, fully penetrant disease when CG length is higher than 39. And this is a very unique situation. There are not many diseases that are autosomal dominant, particularly with the uh, 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 clinical expression in adulthood. Uh, the most of the diseases are, are in, in childhood, and this makes the HD relatively particular. Uh, there are a couple of new developments in, in HD pathogenesis, sorry, uh, that I wanted just to mention. I'm not going to discuss them. One of them is that uh, is now more or less reasonably established that there is a neurodevelopmental component to HD. So HD brains uh, are not normal when they uh, when a child with the with the mutation is born, although uh, until relatively uh, uh, until adulthood those changes are not very apparent. Uh, uh, so when neurodegeneration starts, it starts on the top of a brain that has already some changes that are neurodevelopmental. And this has certainly an impact how we think about HD. A couple of other things that are important to recognize is that now we have a number of genes beyond the causal gene that is located in chromosome four, and it has, it has been known for uh, 30 years now, uh, um, there are a number of new genes, so-called genetic modifiers, that have a very important role in the pathogenesis of the disease. And uh, another important topic is that uh, a number of variants within the causal gene have been identified and they are related with interruptions in the sequence of CGs, which the canonical uh, sequence include an interruption with the CEA. And there are several variants uh, related either with the missing of this interruption or with the, the duplication of the interruption. And this has important consequences. Another issue that I wanted to, to bring just to speak, to mention it, is that now the pathogenesis of HD is, is understood as a two-step approach, where in the first period of time, there is an increase in the length of the CAG. So people are born in, in a, with a CAG of a certain size, but that CAG is changing along life and different cell types have different sizes of CAG. And so there, there is an increase in this, in this number of CAGs to up to several hundreds. And then um, uh, after a certain threshold is achieved, uh, uh, um, the toxicity prop, uh, of the protein, the mutated protein starts to play a role. There is a lot of new research with single cell analysis that has shed light and is shedding light on the process on this pathogenic mechanism. And so I'd say that the understanding of the disease is changing very quickly. We have also uh, made an important achievement in describing the progression of the disease from birth to death using the integrated staging system that was recently published. 
and that shows that the, the disease is a, a process that starts at birth. And when people are born with the mutation, a mutation that is longer than 39, they are in stage zero. When neurodegeneration starts, and this is, is measured by atrophy of caudate or putamen, people are in stage one. When, when subtle signs can be measured, either by total motor score or by the single digit modality test, people are in stage two. And finally, when people have functional impact of those symptoms, they are in stage three. As you can see in this figure, the, the, the decrease on the volume of caudate and putamen is almost linear across the entire progression of the disease. So in this slide, I'm, uh, I'm showing you the clinical pipeline of in Huntington's disease. And uh, these are the, the, the programs that are currently ongoing. They are active. And I must say, uh, this is a, a, a slide that is a bit le more sparse today, 2023, than it, than it was a couple of years ago. So there was a number of programs that uh, uh, were closed for different reasons, mostly safety, for example, of course, the famous Novartis uh, Tommy Nelson uh, uh, trial um, failed, uh, but Roche is still active with the same drug, Tommy Nelson, but uh, Novartis has closed their program, uh, Triplet has closed their program, and they were the only ones that were in the, in the clinical the phase of their program uh, in using targeting a genetic modifier. There are other companies targeting genetic modifiers, but they are still in preclinical space. And then there are uh, other uh, programs related uh, um, uh, with the neuroinflammation targets. Uh, Annexon is pursuing the complement uh, target, and the Vaccine X has pursued the uh, semaphorine for D. So um, there are programs in advanced therapies, gene therapy um, that is not related with anti lowering. So there is a, a company called AskBio that is pursuing a targeting cholesterol metabolism. There are mostly academic attempts uh, related with cell therapy, and there are a couple of different other targets in clinical development. So this is the clinical pipeline in general. And I wanted, before I show you the gene therapy pipeline, uh, to make a, a, a call of attention for the differences between the concept of genetic therapies and gene therapies. They are not synonymous and they have regulatory implications. I know that all this is well known by companies, but I presume that in the audience, there are people that are from another type of environment, academia, investors. Uh, so it's very important to recognize that genetic therapies target the gene or gene products, but they are uh, treated from a regulatory point of view uh, as non-advanced therapies, and they are, uh, let's say, similar with so-called small molecules. While gene therapy, is typically a once in a lifetime treatment. And what is delivered is a, is a, is a gene itself that will be uh, expressed in the brain. And the, uh, the expression of that gene that is delivered might edit or replace uh, existing genes. So uh, there is a, a quite substantive difference. So what is in this slide is the gene therapy landscape. Everything that we know, uh, people are trying to develop for uh, uh, Huntington's disease. And I, I must say, there are some names that I have to omit because uh, they are not in the public domain yet. But I wanted to make clear that there is a, a large number of, um, of um, uh, companies that are pursuing and thinking lowering targets 
uh, through gene therapy using very different mechanisms, I, uh, I would say. Then there are a company that I already mentioned that is Ask Bio that is pursuing a cholesterol target. And there is a company that is pursuing um, transformation of uh, in situ cells uh, into neurons, which is a very different approach uh, from uh, uh, the, the other targets. So what I wanted with this slide is not only to show uh, how many companies there are, which is a lot, there are only two that are in clinical development, Unicure and Askbar. So I wanted now to uh, uh, emphasize some of the limitations or the difficulties that there are with gene therapies. Uh, currently, all, the, all uh, programs that have a gene therapy base in HD use a viral vector to deliver the cargo to the brain. Uh, uh, there is a lot of interest on exosomes and nanoparticles to deliver gene therapies, but to my knowledge, none of these approaches are currently in development, uh, uh, at least in the table that I just showed you. Um, the problem with the viral vectors, and again, uh, I'm sure you all are aware, there is a lot of research on viral vectors that would allow for a system systemical delivery, currently those uh, uh, approaches are not yet being, uh, um, uh, let's say, are not in a, uh, let's say, a, advanced phase of development. So the programs that are really uh, aligned to get, to get in clinical development are planning to deliver directly in the brain, in the structures, typically in the caudate and putamen. And so this, this creates a very important uh, limitation to the gene therapy approach. Uh, there is not just the problem of the administration itself, there is the problem of the distribution. And this is a, a very critical problem with all therapies, but uh, uh, with gene therapy as well. And uh, one important issue that uh, uh, people discuss is, for example, when we speak about Huntington lowering and we say uh, there is, a, or no, the, the therapy is targeting 50% Huntington lowering, are we meaning 50% in it in the total totality of the cells, or are we meaning 50% of the cells? Uh, uh, so what would be, let's say, under percent of lowering in half of the cells, or 50% of lowering in total cells. So it's, it's a complex problem and it does not have a, a, a very easy solution. So I just want to emphasize that when we speak about advanced therapies and about gene therapies, we us usually think about compressed uh, 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 clinical developments in terms of uh, uh, the classical phase of development because the phase one and two typically need to be merged. And these phase, uh, phase one and two trials uh, are of course predicated on establishing tolerability and safety, but they usually want also to show target engagement and proof of concept. And that's where uh, uh, and, uh, biomarkers become of extremely importance, response biomarkers. And of course, Usually the plan is to move from a successful proof of concept to a phase three trial that in the gene therapy approach are still difficult to envisage because of the how to demonstrate efficacy in such trial. And of course, uh, when we speak about small molecules or other type of interventions, usually there is a more classical approach to the development in, in principle it's possible to do a phase one in the healthy volunteers. And of course, uh, being HD, a rare disease, there is a, 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 the temptation of combining phase two with phase three in kind of adaptive trials. I must say, gene therapies pose a particular problem in neurodegenerative diseases. And one of these problems is that uh, when 
non-advanced therapies are sought off and when clinical developments are planned, typically what people tend to aim for are incremental improvements. So people tend to show that there is some benefit that can be built on the top of what is the natural progression of the disease. When we people speak about gene therapy, because gene therapy is invasive and is one in a lifetime kind of a, a therapy, usually people are thinking about large effects or even cur so-called curative effects. And these at the moment don't seem very realistic for HD because uh, uh, curative effects would mean that you would be able with the intervention to clean up all the damage that has already happened. And uh, uh, this is not something that seems very feasible. So uh, there is a true problem regarding the how large can an effect be and uh, how, uh, let's say, relevant can be a gene therapy that does not have a curative effect. And of course, there are other differences like the durability of the effect. And of course, uh, being an invasive, invasive therapy, the, the risk of uh, mitigation. So as I said, for gene therapy studies, uh, uh, response biomarkers have different use cases. And uh, of course, there is a hierarchy on these use cases. And of course, everybody is looking for surrogacy. But if we are realistic, at the moment, we need to cover the, the issue of target engagement and proof of concept, even before we engage on the discussion of surrogacy. And when we discuss surrogacy, even according with FDA, the so-called reasonably like surrogates, we have to establish mechanistic plausibility. We have to show that there is prediction for the natural history events. And then we have to show that there is prediction for the benefit. And for imaging biomarkers, particular structural MRI, I would say we can check this box, mechanistic plausibility and prediction of clinical uh, natural history, but the prediction of benefit is still complicated. So when we speak about response biomarkers in all different uses, let's say target engagement, proof of concept and surrogacy, the first thing that comes to mind is structural MRI, but we should not forget some kind of PET scanning. Uh, PD-10 is a very good candidate uh, biomarker for target engage engagement, particularly in early disease. And as you are aware, CHDI is making uh, strides in developing a, a tracer for Huntington aggregates. There are, uh, I'm going to run through this, but just to mention that there are two re recent um, review papers on MRI and structural MRI. And the one on the left also includes PET scanning. And besides these review papers, I'm sure all of you are aware, there is a, a database of uh, imaging studies. So studies that have included not only clinical data, but some wet biomarker data and very good imaging data. And these studies are listed here. All these studies have been analyzed multiple times, and there has been a lot of publications around these studies. There is a one more recent study that was conducted at UCL with some collaboration from UCHDI as well, where much earlier populations have been studied. And this so-called young adult study have clearly showed that uh, uh, there are changes in the MRI very, very early, even earlier than the track study has shown. So for the imaging data sets, CHVI has made already important contributions, creating what is called the morphometry data set that has been shared with a number of companies and the other academic groups. Uh, this include uh, free, uh, data from free surfer, free surfer version, version six and includes all these uh, uh, data sets combined. But from a technical point of view, this morphometry data set is still insufficient 
and that's why there is the major immunization consortium taking off. Marina will comment on this and I'm not going to say much more. What I'm going to comment very quickly is that, as I said before, there is quite a number of challenge regarding the development of a MRI uh, biomarker as a, a likely surrogate endpoint. I'm not saying that is impossible. I'm just saying that there is a couple of issues that we have to sort, uh, solve before. One of the problems that came, came up and we become aware recently is that most of the antitin lowering therapies have a, a, a consequence that is, there is a, a ventricular enlargement. And this ventricular enlargement does not seem to be related with the atrophy of the caudate and putamen as it was thought before this data came, became available. The first time this was seen was in the Tommy Nelson trial, but it was also seen in the, in the Novartis trial that was closed due to the toxicity of the compound that is unrelated with Huntington and uh, in the Unicure trial. So this ventricular enlargement seems to be a class effect of Huntington lowering and what is the meaning of this uh, ventricular enlargement is not established yet, but it's a complication to use a structural MRI as a measure, for example, of efficacy. And so this is one of the problems. And the other problem is related with the current most common way of administering gene therapy, which is by direct injection in the caudate and putamen. So this, this uh, uh, sorry, image to the, to the right is from PIGS. It's a unicute publication, but uh, it's pig, uh, pig brain. Uh, uh, but the, the problem that is made, the point that I want to make here is applicable to humans, which is when you administer uh, uh, directly to the caudate and putamen, you create a lesion in those structures. And the baseline for, putative assessment of efficacy is not anymore the baseline uh, of the, the trial. So there is a lot of discussion, where should we put the baseline in this case? So I must say that uh, the research we are doing and CGI is very much involved in this, is uh, developing uh, uh, new structures or signatures that can be used to monitor the progression of the disease. We are very, very focused and uh, with a sense of urgency in finding alternative stress structures that are not the caudate and putamen that can be used to be uh, as a response in gene therapy trials. And we are also making a serious effort to try to understand how long the lesion in gene therapy uh, how long it takes to be resolved, and when can we establish, uh, let's say, a secondary uh, baseline for efficacy measures. So this is my last slide. I, I ran through the slides, and I understand I might not be very clear, but I will be happy to answer questions. So what I tried to, to say during these minutes were to, to revise very quickly recent developments in HD pathogenesis, uh, to, to, show, uh, uh, to show that the HDISS is the best way to, to describe disease progression and to define populations for clinical trials, that the pipeline of clinical development uh, seems a bit scarce at the moment, although it's well, uh, let's say, there is a well representation of different programs, but there is a, a very large pipeline of gene therapy approaches that are still uh, before clinical development. They are preclinical or in discovery. There are challenges from gene therapy that uh, impact the use of imaging, uh, but they need to be addressed. And we are trying to make uh, inroads in these problems uh, by addressing the problem of ventricular enlargement and changes in target structures. So this is my final slide, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. That was um, 
That was a lot of food for thought, and I think it really does help us understand uh, the the sort of landscape in a lot more detail with the peaks and troughs, but also the challenges that we're facing in order to really get to uh, to to get to a the the baseline of uh, imaging biomarkers, but also at the same time uh, understanding that the that gene therapies, whilst ex they're exciting, also present the challenges themselves. So. Um, Thank you so much, Christina. I'm now going to pass over the presenter to uh, Marina, um, who will be uh, talking specifically about the imaging biomarkers uh, and um, imaging analysis techniques that we'll, uh, we, we utilize in Huntington's uh, trials. So, Marina, um, take it away. Great. Thank you, Janie. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you okay. Can you see my screen? I see your screen as well. Perfect. Thank you. So thank you, Christina, for this wonderful presentation. I learned a lot for sure. And I'm gonna now continue and focus more about the practical issues of uh, using imaging biomarkers in your trials. And this is a very brief outline of my talk. I'm gonna talk about selectability and safety. I know from the poll, they're not the coolest part of the imaging in AT trials, but they're equally important. Then most of my talk will be about efficacy and some of the, if, some of the difficulties um, that Christina also highlighted in her presentation of using imaging as an ethics endpoint and how we can deal with it and talk about some more exploratory endpoints, some developments in the field and some natural history data sets that we're working on that can help with clinical development. So first and foremost, eligibility. Um, so most standard and eligibility assessment is basically a neuroradiological read uh, to ensure that patients uh, that are recruited, they don't have any other comorbidities that could be risk factors to treatment. Um, and in addition, more recently now with the advent of gene therapies that Christina talked uh, about, uh, regional volume estimates play an important role in identifying uh, patients where that have ad adequate regional volume present and uh, to ensure that they, they can be uh, reached with the, by the neurosurgeon. And that can be, that has a few challenges uh, because A, there's no consensus about, um, there's no published criteria of what adequate regional volume is. There is some empirical data out there um, about this, but it's, it's, there isn't really a published consensus. And also another uh, complexity is that these criteria that uh, somebody uses for their trial is based on their um, um, work on their patient population, their criteria, and they might not match the, the patient population that somebody else is using. So if you're using the same criteria, you might end up having a lot of screen fails because the regional volume that uh, is selected might be too high for the patient population. So it's really, really important as you're planning these studies to do some prep work to understand and for the patient population that you target, what's the expected original uh, volume? And then for the neurosurgeon to be able to have confidence, is this adequate for, for the surgery? So this is something to keep in mind. And the next uh, uh, kind of advancement that happened in eligibility is, like Christina mentioned, the publication of the HD integrated staging system. And the bottom right here, you have the, the four stages uh, that Christina also mentioned. So stage one includes the pretainment and coded volume. Uh, basically, this is the very first stage where you start having differences between healthy controls and patients are still non-symptomatic and then as you move further along the stages you start having more uh, kind of milder uh, symptoms and then um, clinically diagnosed disease. One of the complexities of using uh, imaging or, or volumetric uh, volumetry for um, as a landmark is that the actual number of the cutoff value is dependent on the different software. So different software have a different way of estimating regional volume. They might have, some of them might agree more than others, but that's important to consider. So if you're using uh, cutoffs that have been estimated using one version of software, for example, in this case, the APA separate paper use free surfer version six but you want to use free surfer version seven actually there are quite a few there are some differences between the two and there was some work uh, from uh, Rachel Cahill and he hopes that kind of showed those differences and we are a, with together with HDI and Jeff Long we are actually uh, going to be publishing uh, hopefully in the next year or so a, a paper updating the cutoffs using some of our uh, more recent methods um, to align with some of our more recent methods um, 
Moving on now to safety monitoring. Obviously, uh, this is one very commonly used um, for trials and really, really important. Multiple modalities are used to enable better characterization of the changes. Because these modalities, a lot of times, they're not used for any quantitative analysis. They can be quite low resolution uh, or accelerated type sequences to reduce the scan time and patient burden. Uh, one thing that's kind of a commonly, uh, uh, when we discuss this question, is how often should we be scanning patients? It really depends on what uh, if there's any risk factors or any um, issues that you want to be monitoring closely. For example, if you have a gene therapy trial with, uh, with surgery in the brain, then uh, oftentimes you want to have very short follow-ups uh, after the surgery to be able to, to monitor um, recovery. Um, commonly, these MRI scans are usually just visually read by the neuroradiologist, but more recently, as far as safety monitoring, we can have also some uh, quantitative analysis methods uh, to supplement these reads. For example, you can count the number of microbleeds. And uh, for HD in particular, something Christine also mentioned, ventricular volume is uh, has been quite a useful marker. Uh, the bottom here is the same uh, graph that Christina uh, mentioned from the Tommy Nursen Phase 1B trial, where you can see the ventricular volume starts to show dose-dependent uh, changes uh, even uh, from day 29 onwards. So it's a very sensitive and, and quite a, 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 a fast re reactive system. Something to highlight here, it's unclear what this, what this means, right? We still don't understand in the field what the, the clinical importance of these things, so it's important that they are uh, reviewed by a clinician, but still it's something that's important to monitor um, through a duration of the study, especially if that's a, com a concern to, that it doesn't uh, increase too much. And moving on to the other part of the office is more of interest, talking about efficacy. First, I want to talk about, uh, mention some considerations that are specific for uh, HD and imaging. Uh, as everybody knows, I'm sure, uh, involuntary movements is a characteristic sy um, symptom of uh, Huntington's disease and can affect quality of scans. Um, and that can be particularly important if you're planning a very long trial, for example, five years or more. And some of these gene therapy trials can have a very long, are required to have very long follow-ups. So if you're recruiting patients that already have mild chorea at baseline, uh, then you need to have a good understanding of what the progression uh, will be over this period of time because it might lead to high attrition and that should need to be considered when you're planning um, uh, your analysis. Uh, oftentimes people ask whether mild sedatives could be used to help with the chorea. Obviously sedatives can be used to, and they can help with anxiety and claustrophobia, which are often uh, behavioral system, symptoms of the disease. Uh, so they can be quite helpful. They can help also where chorea is exacerbated by anxiety, but they're not a treatment for chorea, and they can also affect performance of uh, other cognitive or clinical assessments. So it's important to think about uh, if you are allowing for sedatives, whether where uh, the when the scanning is going to happen with respect to this assessment. Moving on now to thinking about a lot of times uh, we have discussions about uh, when should we expect to see an efficacy effect or um, a change, a treatment related effect in imaging data. So as with any other clinical endpoint, the, it will depend on the predicted treatment effects. So how, how big do you think your treatment effects are gonna be? The patient disease stage, uh, are they um, patient, are fast progressing or slow progressing population, the number of patients you're planning to recruit and specific endpoints. So for example, using the codate or the whole brain or the putainment, uh, these will have different trajectories. Um, and now specifically for imaging, something obviously I think most people are, is, is well understood, it's pretty unlikely to be able to see any changes related to efficacy over three or six months. Uh, on the left, on the right here, you this is from the uh, Paddington study, which was a natural history study uh, recruiting patients with manifest disease and had kind of six and nine and 15 month intervals. You can see the effect sizes for the CODE, uh, even up to nine months are quite varied, uh, but after 12 and 15 months, they kind of settled down. So this is something to um, consider uh, when you're planning ahead. And another thing to consider is that different analysis methods will have a different sensitivity, accuracy, and reliability. Uh, that means that if you're planning your study using effect sizes that are produced using a certain algorithm, for example, the boundary shift interval that was used in track HD, but you're using a different method for your studies, uh, you might be underpowered if your uh, current method has lower sensitivity. Um, 
um, but also different methods have different um, biases. On the right here, this is some of our work. This is for Alzheimer's disease, but the point is it compares free fruit to the boundary shift integral, for example, in this case, with uh, controls, MCI and AD. So you can see what the boundary shift integral, you have a nice separation, you have controls coming up here, having the less uh, atrophy rate for all by MCI than with AD. But if you're looking here at free surfer, you have a nice separation between controls and MCI and controls and AD. This is the longitudinal free surfer pipeline, but there's no separation between MCI and D. So it, there's some bias in the algorithm, for example, the plateaus in kind of later disease stages. So again, these are just for you to be aware. It's not um, that different algorithms will have different sensitivities and you need to understand them uh, for your trial. And last but not least, uh, something Christine also mentioned that's really, really important. It's a big learning curve in the field. With the advent of disease-modifying therapies, we're also starting to see uh, effects in the brain that are affecting our ability to detect uh, therapeutic effects. For example, Christina mentioned ventricular expansion and the, the effects of the surgery in, uh, in, in regional structures. Um, these more some methods are more sensitive to these than others and ventricular expansion for example it can create what we call pseudo atrophy because a very large comp expansion of the ventricles can cause compression of the brain particularly the cortical ribbon that can appear like you have accelerated atrophy but in fact it's just the compression of the tissue so we don't have solutions for all of these uh, we have uh, some measure for example the boundary shift into uh, the boundary shift integral perform quite well this despite that because of some characteristics that they have, but not they're not suitable for every region in the brain. For surgery, for surgical trials, I'm gonna talk about it in the next slide. Some, uh, there's still a big uh, learning curve and a lot of development is gonna happen uh, in the next few years. So now moving about recommendations for endpoints, I don't think it's surprising anyone that the Codate and Christina mentioned about it features here so uh, prevalently. It has really high reliability, natural history studies, high sensitivity to disease related stages, it predicts clinical outcomes, it's suitable population across the disease spectrum. Uh, Christina also mentioned that as well. You can see a really nice separation. This is from the track HD 36 month paper. You can see even for, uh, far from months that uh, individuals have a nice separation with the control group. The, the decline or the atrophy rate increases with time. You have these really nice linear slopes. Here I've plotted a codec volume change 24 months uh, against CUHDRS 24 month change. You kind of see a nice, a nice relationship between them. So it's a really nice and robust marker. Uh, again, we don't really have disease modifying treatment, so we don't really know whether it will and how it will respond and uh, in the future. But if, if any, if there's any marker that has some chance of, of, of having some evidence of surrogacy, probably the codec marker, but we need to wait to get these uh, treatment effects. Um, treatment studies. Um, for in Arixico, we're using this method called the boundary shift integral to measure caudate um, atrophy. And what the boundary shift integral is doing, it's looking for changes. It defines an, an area around the boundaries of, of the caudate, and it looks for changes in the in the gradient, the intensity gradient, try to understand whether the region is subsiding or not. And it's particularly robust, I mentioned, to changes in the ventricles because it does it has this process of registration. Basically, the region moves um, with the follow-up um, changes. So it's not very susceptible to the regional changes that happen because of the ventricles. Moving on now, apart from the caudate, obviously the putamen is another region that's really important. It comes up fairly early on in HD. Uh, changes. One of the difficulties with the, with using the putamen as an endpoint, it is that is it's situated deep in the brain, surrounded by white matter, and it has a vasculature crossing the tail. So it makes it particularly tricky to segment accurately uh, or reliably. Um, so you might have more noise in your estimation, particularly when you look in a longitudinal uh, uh, change uh, compared to the caudate. So the caudate is nicely situated uh, along the boundaries of ventricles, so it has really nice contrast. That's why we can measure it really sensitively. So it might not be that the putamen atrophy is uh, uh, slower than the caudate, for example, but it's our ability to be able to measure that change that's, uh, that's limited. We have new methods now with deep learning to be able to uh, to delineate it more accurately, and we, we are, uh, we're looking forward to seeing how that will look in the future. In addition to putamen, if you're looking at populations that are a bit later on in the disease spectrum, as you can see here, as the disease progresses, the atrophy can be detected in visual cortex, in parietal lobe, motor cortex, 
and the third six month uh, track paper show that as well you can see a later stage populations that you can see um, a nice separation from the control group that kind of uh, sustained for a long time the same thing for the white matter volume and great matter volume um, and they have some nice relationship particularly for example whole brain volume with three CUHDRS drs chains um, something that's all for highlighting here for gray matter volume it's one of these methods has um, for example voxel based morphomery three and tensor based morphomic they have uh, advanced quite a bit since these analyses were done for track HD in 2010 uh, or 2011. So it is worth actually revisiting some of these uh, analyses now that we have uh, uh, access to this data. We can reanalyze them in many different ways and to see whether we, the measures can be more sensitive. And why would you want to use non trial volume endpoints? Uh, Christina mentioned it already. Uh, we don't know if you're targeting the striatum. We don't really know uh, how the um, how to measure volumetric change that disentangle it from the effect of the surgery, particularly at uh, kind of shorter time periods. But also, if you're having an, a, a molecule that you expect the distribution is going to be higher in the cortex and subcortical areas, maybe then gray matter volume uh, or whole brain might be a better uh, endpoint than uh, than um, than the caudate. And now moving on a little bit to other modalities. So the um, obviously volumetric MRI has been around for a long time. It was mature at the time that the track and predict studies happened. Uh, diffusion has undergone quite a bit of change uh, in the past few years. With uh, we've had better scanners with better gradients that allow the collection of not just multi-cell, uh, not just single cell but multi-cell data. And we've had a, a wealth of different kind of analysis techniques that have come uh, across. Even so, um, even the standard DTI analysis that relies on single cell data. Uh, you can see changes uh, over time. This is uh, from, um, I believe this is from the, the Paddington study again that looks at changes over 15 months. Uh, over 15 months, you can see changes in white matter regions around the striatum. And why, obviously, diffusion. Uh, probably you wouldn't use diffusion as an efficacy measure, but it can provide supplementary information, particularly for gene therapy. Something that we're starting to think about is the use of what we call free water imaging to see uh, whether we can capture some of these changes that are happening with the uh, dislocation of the interstitial fluids uh, in the tissue that's injected. Um, we still, gene therapy, uh, as I mentioned before, is still a developing field. So we still don't understand a lot about how these measures will perform, especially over the long-term follow-ups, and we're still learning a lot. But at the moment, it's important to, if you can add more, some of these kind of more exploratory sequences to be able to see how they perform, because we know volumetric data, particularly over 12 months, might not be particularly informative. Uh, Christine also mentioned PET. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of PET-like, as we try and, tried and tested in HD from FTG, D2T3, um, SV2A, TSPO, and uh, PD10A, yeah, I would agree with uh, Christine, is one of the ones that um, you can see differences from controls very early on. Um, you can also measure reliable change over one year follow-up. Some of the other pet traces, for example, FTG might take a lot long, a longer for natural history data depending on your population. And it's also a, a PT10A is very uh, focused in the stratum. You can use it probably in gene therapies for uh, target engagement because it doesn't, uh, so PET has been used, for example, in uh, PD gene therapies after tr um, um, to look at changes uh, in dopamine in the uh, in the stratum following injection. So it might be uh, one one of these, um, uh, one of these uh, measures that would be useful there. Something to consider, though, is that there's not that many commercial tracers out there. So PD10A is not a commercial tracer. So distribution and availability might be a challenge, particularly if you're planning a big study. So it's something to consider. Other modalities are MR spectroscopy, quantitative MRI, um, uh, arterial spill lingering, functional MRI. They weren't really that uh, mature at the time when these large studies were happening in HD. So a lot of the data that we have for these studies is from very small, smaller studies. Uh, MR spectroscopy in particular has been developed quite extensively over the last few years with the advent of semi-laser type of sequences that have improved the SNR. In the past, we've, only, we've used, we've seen some publications using press, 
which haven't really been able to show reliable change over time in MRS signal. However, maybe the, the more recent uh, sequences might be able to be more sensitive. QSM has also kind of undergone quite a bit of development. Here you can see a really beautiful image of a QSM where you can see on the on the right side, this is an HD brain. You can see the really high signal in the stratum, much higher than the control group. And that's because of the, it's, it has higher iron concentration. Um, again, these, there hasn't really any studies that shown reliable change over time for QSM, but there has been a lot of changes, developments in the reconstruction of a QSM to try to make the signal, the SNR, to increase the SNR. So it might be something worth following up. And the, one of the advantages or the nice properties of, of QSM is that you really see the globus pallidus that is very difficult to uh, do volumetric analysis on because again, similar to the putamen, it's very, it's a smaller region, it's surrounded uh, by white matter, it's gone deep in the brain, so the contour is quite poor, but you get a really nice QSM signal there. So it might be, if you're interested in that region, for example, if there's a possibility of tr transduction following gene therapy, it might be a target to look at. For arterial spin labeling, the, again, there's not that much data out there. Functional MRI has been used extensively in HD. There's very little evidence that it's uh, sensitive longitudinally, particularly resting state of MRI has very poor reliability. But if you're looking at symptoms uh, of uh, behavioral or cognitive um, symptoms, then using task might be an option. However, just keep in mind that um, getting multi uh, uh, multi site task fMRI is not a very is not for the faint hearted uh, because many centers don't really have that expertise, but it might be applicable for a smaller study. And to conclude my presentation, as Christina mentioned, we, uh, together with CHDI and other pharma partners, we started this consortium study called HDIH. And the aim of the HDIH is to have, to prepare a highly curated volumetric imaging data set linked to rich phenotypic, genotypic, and fluid biomarker data that will enable sponsors to plan their study. As I've kind of weaved in throughout my talk, you know, so history data is particularly important when you're planning the study and also kind of a later stages, um, but especially when you're planning the study to be able to identify you using the right endpoints for your patient population, the right criteria, and so forth. And we have basically we're analyzing the track, track on, predict, image HD, and more recently we're going to be adding the KIT JHD to the pool, and we're going to be analyzing exactly the same way we're using for clinical trials. So it's going to be a high quality. Um, data set that you can use for regular theory purposes. And just to highlight as well, doing a lot of juvenile onset HD is an unmet need. And this will be one of the first uh, cohorts that we will be analyzing them together with adult uh, onset HD to be able to identify if there's anything different in this patient population. If you're interested to find out more, just let us know, get it back to us after the webinar. And thank you so much for listening. That will be all from me. Thanks, Marina. Um, there is a lot of food for thought there, but I think there's a, I think it's, it's just goes to show that there's a plethora of uh, uh, imaging modalities and analysis methods that we can utilize uh, to, 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 pro, to propel our understanding in treating Huntington's and also the disease progression as well. So uh, what I'd like to do now is, Robin's now on the screen, and I think I'd like to also bring back Christina. Now, apologies, we're running a little bit tight on time, but if you're still around, that'd be great because we would love to answer these questions. There are a lot of them. So I guess like, without further ado, Robin, take it away. Yeah, I'll, I'll get right into it and we'll probably have to come back to some of your questions via email um, or follow up as Jane said earlier, but maybe to kick it off with a more general uh, question to uh, Christina, I'd like to put that one. How far are we um, out from having a surrogate biomarker or being able to eliminate those mentioned as lectured options? Yes. <laughs> okay. That's the big one. Uh, th yeah, that's the holy grail. Uh, I, do, um, I don't know exactly how, uh, what is the metric of how far. Uh, so um, if it is about timelines, uh, I, I would say that short of a, a clinical trial coming out, quote unquote, positive, uh, and uh, which would accelerate this process a lot, uh, uh, I, would, I would put it the best in the best scenario, maybe two to three years. Okay, thanks. That sounds like something to look forward to then. Um, and then maybe as a follow-up or more specific biomarker question to yourself, Christina, if ventricular enlargement in the trial is not due to atrophy, what is it due to? 
how can a ventricle become larger without the brain shrinking? I guess another big question. Yeah, that's another big question. I'd say nobody knows the exact answer, but the the mechanism is likely to be increase in CSF or s slowing of circulation of the CSF. So either the total volume is of CSF is increased or uh, the, sl the flow is slower. And there is an hypothesis, and it's an hypothesis, that for that the cilia, uh, the cilia bodies, uh, uh, are may be affected by the lowering of antitin, and the, the, this effect might be uh, reflected in the uh, change in the flow of the CSF. You you are probably aware that uh, during the Tommy Nelson trial, not only there was this uh, slight increase on in ventricles, but there are a, a couple of cases where people had full-blown hydrocephalus. So one of such cases is published. And this effect has not been seen only in the Tommy Nelson trial. Actually, in the, in the SMA trials, although the phenomenon is much less, uh, let's say, uh, visible, there are also increasing ventricles. So in that case, in SMA, probably would not support the idea that this is related to venting thin lowering. So I'm saying that this is a, a field of high interest and uh, we are trying to get to answers, but the mechanism should be related with the CSF. Okay, thanks for uh, providing those insights, Christina. And if we have time, maybe I'll, I'll just like to, as a follow-up, a more practical question, a more image analysis question, maybe directed to Marina. So does uh, ventricular expansion uh, impact striatal volume? That's the question. Thank you. I, I guess so, um, the way yeah. I interpret it is if, if you're measuring or if you're observing those potential those expansions around the ventricle, does that impact the measurement we, we get elsewhere in the brain? Yeah. So as, as I mentioned, it depends. Um, certain software and algorithms have a different um, different sensitivities to this kind of thing. So the boundary shift integral that we are using and was used in track HD, for example, has this really nice property that it moves, it, it has this registration step where it moves the mask, the baseline mask to the location, the follow up. Right, because one of the things what happens with the ventricles when they're expanding is the the position of the ventricle of the caudate has moved with respect to where it was in the baseline. So if your your baseline mask, for example, stays where it is at follow up, and you're trying uh, at baseline and you're trying to look at the change at follow up, then you can come with what we call like a, a, a pseudo atrophy or an accelerated sort of atrophy, but it's not real. It's just because the the, the caudate has moved. But if you move the mask, the location, the new position of the of the ventricle of the caudate, you will be able to act more accurately look at that because even though you have compression but when you want to look at the cortical ribbon then that's more problematic because that's where we see a lot of this compression for example in the hydrocephalus cases you can see more compression at the top at the high convex of the brain right so it really depends on the region but it also depends on the software that you're using um whether it's going to be affected by some of these Okay, thanks. So, Thank Dania, I'll keep going until you interrupt me because this is really um, good interaction um, with questions still coming in. And there's actually a follow-up to um, to uh, Christina's um, uh, summary she just gave. If HCT lowering affects CSF flow, would this effect not be sustained as long as the drug is administered versus resolving over three months? Again, coming back to the uh, ventricular enlargement. Christina, are you still there? Here, I was, okay, no, I, I, yes. Um, I, I'm saying that uh, this matter of the flow of CSF is still is speculative, although uh, even before all this uh, um, uh, data that have come up from clinical trials, there are old research data that shows an effect of Huntington in the cilia. So I would say, and this is speculation, but if the effect is related with Huntington lowering, it will it will remain 
during the period that the Huntington is lower. So in my mind, it's not a transitory effect if that is the mechanism. But as I said, we don't know. <laughs> okay, thanks. And I'll do one more question to Marina and then I'll hand it back to Jane and we'll follow up on the remaining questions. Can you discuss the pros and cons of the use of voxel-based morphometry for assessing volumetric changes in the corded entertainment in addition to RRI-based approaches? Would this be more appropriate for intraparenchymal based gene therapy approaches for HD, where it is not anticipated that the entire structure will be transduced with the uh, therapeutic vector? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in the past, when we looked at actually comparing the, the, the boundary shift integral to um, the Jacobian uh, or voxel based or tensor based morphology, the boundary shift integral has has been more sensitive. It has, is not, it has this very nice linear curve um, compared to the Jacobian. It's still an open question. We don't really know how um, what will happen with a in interbarcanal um, trials um, whether. Um, this how the Jacobian would perform because you have this so how these voxel based or tensor based conformity works is that it's looking at intensity um, changes to try to estimate the deformation field so when you still have these changes in the structure the the tensor base the tensor will be sensitive to them so I think it will be equally um, it will be equally affected and possibly even more than the BSI in the region that is injected um, but again we have this is something that it, like we're still looking at the moment or we're still trying to understand how these methods uh, behave in this pre in the presence of, of the injection. So there is some learning to to still do uh, in that in this in this aspect. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And there is back to you, Jane. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Um, I just want to say, Christina, Marina, uh, Robin, thank you so much for that Q&A. And I also thank you to everybody else that's managed to hang on. I mean, I'm, I I can keep going for a long while, but obviously, like, we've got a limit here. Having said that, if we didn't answer your question, we are going to come back to you by email or another form of communication that's suitable for you. Um, but in the meanwhile, uh, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to the work that we do on LinkedIn and Twitter, and we'll keep you informed. You can also subscribe to any content that we do have uh, via our um, contact, uh, for, by our subscribe to our content page, um, which I'll post uh, later on in emails. But otherwise, if you are if you have missed out quite a bit or you missed out the Q&A, don't worry, we'll send you a recording as well. Um, and otherwise, we want to thank you for your time and thank you for joining us for this webinar. Really appreciate it. Have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.